Closed captioning provided by Beaufort County. Welcome to Low Country Law on Air. I'm your host, Bob Brummage. I'm the Public Information Officer for the Beaufort County Sheriff's Office. On this episode, we're going to be discussing the new open carry law, hurricane preparedness and evacuation, and consideration for your pets during an evacuation. Our first guest is Captain Will Angelo of the Beaufort County Sheriff's Office. Will, welcome aboard. Thank you. Tell us about yourself. Uh, well, Major, um, I first uh, started with the Sheriff's Office here in 1998. I moved here from uh, New Jersey. Uh, about 2001, I left and went to Washington, D.C. and worked for Metropolitan Police Department. Returned here in 2003. Uh, since then, I've worked the road. Uh, I've been assigned as a supervisor north and south of the broad. Uh, in about 2007, 2008, I transferred into the training section, uh, worked my way up through the training section. Now I am the captain of the headquarters. Um, which, which includes training? It includes training, uh, crime prevention. Um, we also have the quartermaster, which is our supply manager right. that's underneath of us. Uh, we have hiring and staffing, which is under headquarters. Uh, and then we also are in charge of the COVID uh, basic uh, response for the sheriff's office. So you're actually monitoring cases within the sheriff's office for COVID-19 throughout the pandemic? Correct. We were responsible for monitoring that. We're also responsible for uh, when we were getting our vaccinations. I had to set it up with the hospital and we were able to get our employees vaccinated through Beaufort Memorial Hospital that way. And ensuring that deputies that do test positive for COVID-19 or employees are quarantining the appropriate amount of time and Correct. following. They're, they're following the CDC guidelines, quarantine for the amount of time making sure they're not having contact with any other individual with possible spread of the exposure of the uh, COVID virus. So training is becoming more and more important in a national conversation, uh, clearly. So you've got your hands in all kinds of different things at this point. You've got uh, use of force, you've got de-escalation, you've got uh, making sure the uh, deputies and the employees are up to date on uh, continuing education. There's so many, so many factors to your job and so many different facets. Correct, and, and like you <coughs> said, uh, de-escalation is a huge topic now throughout the country. Same thing with use of force, and they go hand in hand. Uh, if you fail to properly de-escalate a situation, your use of force will increase as the person's uh, level of resistance increases. So uh, that's a huge uh, task going on right now with the sheriff's office, trying to balance that. Uh, de-escalation and that use of force that goes hand in hand. So being internationally accredited through CALEA is a very important step in making sure that you have consistent standards of use of force, de-escalation, and standardized training for all the deputies. Uh, has it been valuable? I mean, as far as we're hearing a lot about use of force uh, nationwide and uh, excessive force complaints, we found that we already had these policies in place to address those issues. We weren't doing chokeholds. We weren't doing certain things that were other agencies that weren't accredited you know, were allowing at that point. Cor correct. Uh, we were probably f a lot <coughs> further advanced than some of those agencies because of the clear accreditation where they had set those policies and procedures prior uh, to these mandates coming down through the uh, president and the Presidential Reform Act. Uh, so we, we were doing very well with that where we followed what Khalid was saying and then we implemented those policies. Well, we appreciate what you do. And Thank you. And stand on top of things because there's a lot going on. Thank you. So let's talk about the open carry law. And uh, one of your duties is also making sure that the uh, deputies uh, are aware of the open carry law and what the parameters are that went into effect on August 15, 2021. Um, the biggest thing that you're going to notice and uh, our residents will notice, our uh, visitors will notice, tourists, is that the South Carolina has agreed to do the open carry uh, with Training Act, which is the open carry as long as you are a CWP holder. It doesn't mean that anyone can walk around uh, the streets of South Carolina and have their weapon uh, exposed. Uh, so that's going to be the biggest thing that you've noticed. Uh, the act in there comes with this <coughs> Training Act now. It's requiring these individuals that have a CWP from August 15th forward uh, with the uh, open carry with Training Act, you're going to see that these individuals that go through the CWP course. There's several things they have to go and uh, take care of now. Uh, during the class, they're going to have to teach properly securing a firearm from a holster. They have to show that it's cocked and locked carrying a firearm. And basically what that's for is, you know, throughout the years, there's a trend of weapons that go through. In the 1911s, the 45 calibers are very popular. Uh, so they're the single action weapons where it's usually cocked and ready to go. So they have to go through training on that also now. Uh, they also have to how to respond if somebody's trying to take your firearm 
from you if you have it drawn out or you have it pointed at somebody. And then you also have to be able to uh, take care of your weapon and uh, secure it in your holster or wherever you're at if you're showing it exposed. And you'll also have to receive, just like we do, de-escalation uh, training. Uh, so that's something that's added to the Training Act now. And what does that entail, the de-escalation training? That's basically, instead of having to draw that weapon, you're actually trying to de-escalate the situation before you have to draw the weapon. So it's using your verbal language and trying to calm that individual down uh, so you don't have to draw that weapon and possibly use force. So avoiding a confrontation with a firearm. Correct. Of critical importance, especially with us as law enforcement officers and should be with the public as well. It, exactly, and they, do the, they can do the best ability they can okay. uh, depending on the situation. So Will, can private and public businesses, governments restrict uh, entry into their premise uh, for concealable weapons or open carry weapons? Yes. Um, there is proper signage. Uh, the, the statute actually has in there the exact dimensions. Uh, you can find all that stuff out by going through uh, SLED's website, which is sled.sc.gov. Um, but a business owner can restrict anybody coming into their establishment uh, from carrying a concealed weapon or an open carry weapon. Uh, and usually what that looks like, a sign midway up the door, no concealable weapons allowed in all capital letters. Correct. And it has a handgun with a circle around it with a, a, a line through it as well. Correct. Right. Uh, and you'll see those on the doors and it has to be uh, visible <laughs> as soon as you walk in through those front doors of that business. Okay. Well, where are people not allowed uh, to carry a concealed weapon or an open carry? Well, under the statute, there, there are several areas that you are not allowed. And I'm going to read these just so I can cover all of them because I think it's very important. You probably will not see signage there. Um, you will see some, some signage in some areas. Okay. Uh, but under the law, you cannot carry them in a law enforcement, correctional, or detention facility, courthouse or courtroom, polling places on election days, office, or the business meeting of the governing body of a county, public school district, municipality, or special purpose district, school or college athletic event not related to firearms, daycare facility or preschool facility, place where the carrying of firearms are prohibited by federal law, church or other established religious sanctuary unless express permission is given by the appropriate church official or governing body, hospital, medical clinic, doctor's office, or any facility where medical services or procedures are performed unless expressly authorized by the employer or express written consent may allow individuals of his choosing to enter the property regardless of any posted sign or to the contrary. Uh, into the residence or dwelling of another person without the express permission of the owner or person in legal control or possession, and into a business that sells alcohol, beer on premise cons for on-premise consumption if the person is consuming alcohol or the business has a no concealed weapon sign posted. So if someone with a concealed weapons permit or uh, has an open carry and goes into one of these places that's clearly posted no concealable weapons allowed, what are the penalties for that? Correct. They, uh, it's a misdemeanor. They can be uh, imprisoned up to 30 days in jail and fined not more than $200 for the first offense. Second offense would be mandatory one year uh, revocation of their CWP license uh, and then the fines go up from there. So what are we seeing so far uh, in Beaufort County as far as people uh, carrying openly? Uh, we're really not seeing a lot of the open carry. Uh, we haven't received any calls on it yet. Uh, speaking with several CWP holders, uh, most of them have said that they are going to continue to carry concealed. Uh, they, they just feel they don't want to alarm anybody in the general public or tourists is probably where you're going to get most of our complaints from. They come from other states and they're not used to seeing an open carry. So uh, like I said, most, most of them are just opting to stay with that concealed side of the house. Okay, well, uh, anything else or we really appreciate having you on? No, that's it. I appreciate you for having me here. And, uh, I'm, I'm I feel confident you'll be back on talking about training because, again, that's a very important topic that's behind the scenes that really the public needs to know about, right. how much is involved in uh, maintaining a certification as a law enforcement officer. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back uh, with hurricane preparedness in a minute. Whether you're traveling or at home, you're... Where is your emergency? Okay. Where is your emergency? Okay. Do I need the address for verification? Do I need the address for verification? Is he breathing? You don't feel a pulse? 
Most of the time when these people are calling in, they're having what might not be an emergency to you, but it is an emergency to them. And they need someone they can talk to who maybe not necessarily understands what they're going through, but is compassionate about what they're going through and empathetic and trying to keep them calm until help can get there for them. He said his hand is cold. An emergency service dispatcher really is the first responder. The lifeline to connect you with emergency services. They are the ones that get the initial information. They're the first person that a caller speaks to to give them that emergent information they have. And the officers, we're the first ones to speak to them to get them rolling and get them in route. EMS 1, respond to a cardiac arrest. We take non-emergency calls and emergency calls. Everything from I need a number for this place. Locked out of vehicles, property damage, vandalism, armed robberies, shots fired. Loose dogs up until death of a family member. A lot of these people that are calling in are not having their best days. You gotta wanna help people and wanna be that voice of reason. This could be my family member on the line and I want to provide the best service I can to my family. So I try to treat every person that calls into this center as if it was a family member of mine. I can give you instructions on CPR, but you'd have to get him over on his back. Are you able to do that? There are days where it's very overwhelming once you get in the door. We're not acknowledged as first responders, but we are the first responders. To be able to give somebody the help in the time of need is the best thing. That's what we do. That's what we come to work to do. Come to work to help. Hey, this is 911. We had to hang up from those numbers. Everything all right? It's a very, very rewarding career. It's never the same from one day to another. Okay, what's going on? Someone's taking your mail. You're always getting something new. I grew up here, so to be able to give back to the community in a positive way, to me, is probably the best thing about working in this career field. I am a... I am a... I am a... I am a County. 911. Emergency Services Dispatcher. Dispatcher. Welcome back. With me in the studio is Lieutenant Adam Zamar of the Sheriff's Office, who's currently assigned to Emergency Management Division. Adam, tell us about yourself and your background. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I've been with the Sheriff's Office for 15 years. Uh, 15 years ago, I started with patrol, worked my way into investigations, then to the narcotics field. And about a year and a half ago, um, the Sheriff asked me to join the Emergency Management Division as a lieutenant as operations and communications. What are some of your responsibilities? Uh, on my day-to-day -day responsibilities, I oversee the dispatch center, um, the dispatchers who answer the 911 and non-emergency lines for our citizens in Beaufort County. Uh, I also uh, assist the emergency management division commander with planning, preparing, and strategies in the events for an all hazards event, which is a, uh, a general term in emergency management, dealing with hurricanes, tornadoes, severe weather, hazmat incidents, and any kind of uh, critical incident that could occur in Beaufort County. So most people associate emergency management with hurricanes, clearly. Specifically so, here, yes. So many other functions that uh, yes. you're involved with. Absolutely. So, so what's new with the 2021 hurricane season? Well, the 2021 hurricane season is obviously upon us. Hurricane season runs from October, I'm sorry, June 1st through the end of November. Um, as of last year, uh, NOAA predicted an active season again. Um, we're predicting about 17 storms, 10 named storms, and possibly three or four major storm, storms. Uh, major storms are indicated by uh, classifications of four or higher, three, four or higher. And we've seen a c couple, you know, that we've paid attention to so far. Yes. And where are we at with what Noah predicted? For well, we're first? halfway through our season. Um, generally for Beaufort County, end of August through September is our most active time. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have experienced Tropical Storm Elsa, which impacted us uh, about a month ago, and a tornado did make impact on Paris Island and in the town of Port Royal. So we have experienced the storm so far already this year. And that was a confirmed tornado? Yes, the National Weather Service did come down and confirmed it was a tornado that touched down. And they assessed the damage and yes, they did. the routes and yes. everything else? Fortunately, there were no injuries <clears throat> um, to our citizens, so we were very lucky with that incident. Yeah, thank God. So. How do residents stay prepared for hurricanes? Especially, we've got a lot of a lot of people moving in to Beaufort County from other places that uh, may have not lived on the coast before. But this is something we deal with every year, but they may not have had exposure to it. So, where, where do they find their information about how to prepare? And our citizens and visitors have uh, there's a plethora of sources of information. Um, they can go to the Beaufort County Sheriff's Office website. There's um, um, portals there and links there to other. Uh, sources of preparation, ready.gov, our CERT uh, sites. Um, they can also go to us, us, our, our Facebook page and our Twitter accounts follow us there. But the biggest thing is to have a plan and prepare. Ready.gov ready 
has a list of all items someone could, would need in preparation for a hurricane or a storm event. So we, with our new website, which we just launched this year, uh, we have a uh, storm center. Yes. Which includes resources, people, you know, links to resources where people can read up on this. And if somebody wants to follow the weather, what, what's your advice on that? Because, I mean, that's, that seems to be a big thing. When a storm's coming this way, uh, a tropical storm or a hurricane, what, what's, where's the best place to follow that by the hour? Follow official sources. The National Weather Service, NOAA, um, those are... Um, scientists who, spe who specialize in just those type of events, they're going to give the correct, precise information that is needed for people to stay aware and informed on the event. And also, if there is something to worry about, we have all kinds of uh, sites that we post information regularly, especially when there's a hurricane threat. We've got our Facebook page. We've got a website, which is uh, www.bcso.net. We've got Nextdoor. We've got Twitter. Yes. And those are our main avenues of getting information out. And again, we're getting information directly from South Carolina Emergency Management Division. Correct. And on a county level, which we're at, uh, distributing to the municipalities. So yes. we've got timely information and accurate information. Yes, verified information, yes. Very good. Okay. So we're talking about you know, where people can get information. We also uh, have a uh, brand new hurricane hotline number. And what is that number? The Hurricane Hotline is a toll-free number um, people in Beaufort County, citizens, visitors can call into and obtain current information on the event, specifically hurricanes or tropical storms um, that is impacting the county. It's uh, free. The number is 1-833-254-6400. Um, it is broken up into designated areas. Each municipality has their own um, separate line um, along with the military bases and unincorporated Beaufort County. And unincorporated Beaufort County, uh, which is St. Helena, Ladies Island, Burton, Sheldon, those areas. And we are going to put the same information that we distribute to the public through Nixle on that. Correct. Which people that may not subscribe to Nixle and may just watch, you know, watch TV and you know want their information from a hotline number. This is a great place to get that information. It's going to be timely. It's going to be accurate. Yes, absolutely. It's just another source outside of uh, television, social media. You have a phone line you can call into to get the same information. So the big question is, what do people need to prepare for in the event of a hurricane? The biggest thing they need to do is have a plan, have a course of action already ready in place before the storm is going to impact us. If the storm's already here, it's too late. So what individuals need to know, families need to know, is create a plan well beforehand. If there's an evacuation order, know where you want to go. Are you going to a hotel? Are you going to a family member's house? Are you going to a friend's house? Are you going to a shelter? Know where the shelters are at. Communicate with your family. Hey, a storm's coming our way. We need to come stay with you for a couple of days. Hotels. Hotels are critical. Already have an idea of what hotel you want to go to, whether it's Columbia, Charlotte, Tennessee. Know which one you might want to go to. Have their phone number written down. Same thing for your pets, pet lovers out there. Not all hotels take pets. Know which ones do. Know those numbers in advance. And there are no shelters in Beaufort County. That is correct. So let's talk about where those shelters are and are there COVID-19 considerations still? Yes, there are. Um, there are no shelters in Beaufort County. Uh, Beaufort County is one entire evacuation zone. Because of that, the Red Cross will not open an evacuation shelter in Beaufort County. The closest one is in Jasper. Jasper County and Beaufort County came together and pretty much decided and formulated a plan to open a shelter at the original Hardyville High School. It's, it's rated by the Red Cross. Um, a lot of money was invested to us, so citizens of Beaufort County and Jasper County and surrounding areas can go there for safe harbor. Um, that is the closest one that's recommended one to go to. Now, the COVID-19 considerations, uh, you know, especially in 2020, you're hearing about how they were just allowing a third of the possible occupancy yes. um, during an evacuation. Fortunately, we didn't have an evacuation. That is, we were very fortunate last year that we did not have to. Um, hopefully we will be fortunate again this year, but in the event that we do have to evacuate and the shelter does open, it is limited due to COVID capacity. Um, the number is diminished in size. Um, if you do show up and it is full, you will still find a way, the government will find a way to get you to another shelter, so you will be taken care of. And all this information, will again, will be distributed through our Nixle advisory system. Uh, Facebook, our website, and Twitter. Yes. And next door. Yes. So. Well, Adam, really appreciate you having here, and I'm sure you'll be back again. It's a, a interesting topic a lot of people are interested in, and again, it's always great to educate the public on what to do in the event of a hurricane. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for having me. Thank you.
We'll be right back with considerations for pets during an evacuation. Cars all over Beaufort County are being targeted by thieves. We want to remind you not to leave valuables in your car and to keep your doors locked. If you have any information about recent thefts, please contact the Beaufort County Sheriff's Office or Crime Stoppers. Welcome back. In the studio with me is Tallulah McGee, the director of Beaufort County Animal Services. Welcome, Tallulah. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Tell us about yourself and your position, what your day consists of. Well, with Beaufort County Animal Services, you know, our first um, priority is public safety. And not only for pets, but for people and for wildlife as well. So, you know, one thing we do is we're out trying to um, control population. That's where animal control comes in. But then also help people in the community to fix their problems so that we don't have a continual problem. We're very proactive and we want to keep pets in their homes. So you respond to neglect situations where you have a complaint of, let's say, dogs or horses not being taken care of properly. Yeah, most of the time it's, it's accidents happen, animals are running at large, um, they get out. Um, then if there's not adequate housing, it's more education. So we try to fix the problem versus ticket. So, you know, our animal control officers are out there all the time, you know, trying to educate and assist people that need help, especially during these times. So you've been involved in several, you know, obviously numerous reports of uh, neglect when we had a situation in one of uh, one of the gated communities on Hilton Head where we had uh, I can't even remember how many dogs right. were on, on property and some had some had died and you know they just weren't being cared for that's when you come in and try to better educate yeah we, you know we do have uh, hoarding situations mm -hmm. as, as you know we call it and a lot of its mental illness and so you know we understand and so we try to we don't want to take all their animals, we want to get them down to a level, and then it, then we do welfare checks. We're constantly checking on them, taking them food, because you know th these animals mean a lot to people, they just got a little overwhelmed, and too many. So when they're hoarding, basically you come in and say, you know, this is a manageable amount of animals. Correct. Uh, for yes. you, and so, okay. And you find homes for these animals otherwise, I would imagine. Right, yeah, and the main thing is just a clean environment for the animals to live, because a lot of hoarders, you know, they just accumulate, <laughs> whether it's animals or things. Um, our job is to, we want them to keep a certain amount of animals, but then also we want to check on them and make sure, and we've had, you know, several hoarders that, you know, we've become very close to, so, and managed them over the past eight years. So follow-up's a very important part of your job. Oh yes, well. definitely. Okay, so one of the biggest questions we get, and now that we're in hurricane season again, mm -hmm. what do people need to prepare for if they have, we'll start with dogs and cats, you know, domesticated type animals. What do they need to prepare for if uh, in the event a hurricane is heading this way? And how do they prepare for, you know, what are some of those considerations? Well, the main thing is, you know, a crate is ideal to have. And then, you know, you have your kit that, you know, everybody knows about if they've moved to the coast is, you know, you have your rabies tag. You have medication your dog's on, you know, f you know, food. At that time, typically you'll have food in the house um, regardless. But to have everything in one location, um, because when a storm comes, you know, sometimes you forget, you know. So I always carry, I have one thing in a box, and then the additional things, I have the list in the box, so if I forget something that, you know, that might expire, I remember to put that in. Um, so that you have everything, if you go to a shelter or to a hotel, or you know, out of town, they're going to require you to show proof of vaccines. So prepare in advance. Have a plan prior to hurricane season. That in the event there is an evacuation, that you have your crates, you have your pets' medications, mm -hmm. you have all these logistics worked out already. Right. Is there a is there a website or a place they could find these resources to read more about this? You know, I always recommend the national organizations in this regards because they have so much time to spend you know, updating it. But, you know, ASPCA Pro has a great um, website that has all the list of things you need. Microchipping is, you know, required in this county. It's a smart thing to do, but I always tell people, put the old tag with your name and number because you're in a different location. Something might happen. The crate might break. Um, identifying the animal is huge. <coughs> okay, so we talked about dogs and cats. Okay, but there are many people in the community with horses, 
livestock, exotic animals. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the considerations there? And speaking to you, you the other day, you were talking about, hey, there are resources for people to yes. have their horses picked up. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and, and what I, I always tell people, call me now. Don't call me two days <coughs> before a storm because I can't help because we're busy evacuating ourselves. Um, but we do have people in Aiken that you know we can put them in touch with that have the ability to help with housing. Um, you know, they've got trailers. You know, I've got that list, and the state also has a list. But it's it's nice to do that now. Don't wait till two days because I really cannot assist people at that time. Um, goats, you know, chickens are a huge problem in this county because the um, I guess people are having backyard farms now because of COVID. So if you get an animal, what are you gonna do with it? I mean, people have to think before they purchase something. Exotics, they require heat, they require electricity. Um, you know, we've seen what Florida did with the pythons. You know, it's destroying the Everglades. So, you know, you really need to think before you purchase something. How am I going to take this with me if something happens? And clearly they can get a hold of you or a member of your team now, to discuss yeah. further. And now is a good time rather than a couple of days out from a hurricane uh, maybe impacting our area. Yeah, and you know, and I tell people, you know, the vacation rental by owners, Airbnb, they're great. I call ahead, you know, talk to them, almost like a MOU, and say, look, I've got, because I've got three goats, I have chickens, I have dogs, cats, and I said, can I rent, in case of a storm, can I have an agreement that I can rent your barn and have my caretaker live above it, care for my animals? So, you know, they can call you because they're people that own the homes and they can work out an agreement, you know, during storms. And, you know, they usually work with it. If they say no pets, if you make that phone call, they'll say during a storm we'll make an exception. So make those phone calls now, not, you know, two days prior. Okay, and what about tethering a, a pet uh, during a tropical storm or hurricane? What are the prohibitions uh, against that? Well, as you know, like, right when I started, it seemed like we got hit <clears throat> with one, two, every year it's like a hurricane. And the gaps, you know, we saw gaps, as every department does, is like, where are we failing? Where do we need to fill in? And, and one thing was the tethering. Um, we have very limited officers, and animal control officers out in the field. So when we get a call and they say, the neighbor's gone, they left their animal tied out, we have to go. And then when we get there, the people are inside watching TV, and I was like, okay, I'm done. Because, you know, people are concerned driving by. I think they left the dog. I think they left the dog. So our job is to go by the dog, the owners are still there. So if there's a name storm, the owners have to have the dog on a leash so that we're not wasting our resources checking that out. And then they have to take it inside. It cannot be outside unless the owner's with it. Tallulah, how is someone able to get a hold of you or a member of your staff if they have questions regarding uh, the, the care of their pet, uh, what to do during an evacuation? How do they get a hold of you? The best way is email, which is shelter at bcgov.net. And then our phone number is 843-255-5010. We are on social media as well. Excellent. Tula, thank you for being on the show. Thank you. We hope you found this episode informative. On behalf of Sheriff P.J. Tanner and the men and women of the Beaufort County Sheriff's Office, we appreciate your partnership and the safety of our community. We look forward to seeing you again. If you have a question or a comment, please contact Low Country Law on air at lowcountrylaw at bcgov.net.